uh, I posted there also a link to the uh, sign up sheet if you want to put your name there. Uh, I also put the link here in the chat uh, in the Zoom. So uh, uh, Fabian has to leave uh, sharp even before uh, the end of the hour. So let's uh, have a, a start, a head start. So thank you, Fabian. Go ahead. Okay. Um... Great, so welcome to part two of the Structure Formation Lecture. Uh, first of all, I noticed that yesterday I didn't give any outline of the whole plan of the lecture. So let me do that now. Um, so what we covered yesterday was the starting point, which is the for matter in the universe, which is the collisionless Boltzmann equation. And then we did took the fluid approximation and we went all the way to study the linear evolution. Uh, when all the perturbations are small. So that's where we were yesterday. Now today we're gonna cover how we go beyond linear theory. So in particular using perturbation theory. Um, next up uh, tomorrow will be uh, another tool, a numerical tool to do this, uh, namely simulations. And then we'll discuss uh, the overall, how nonlinear structure looks. Um, and then in the third lecture or fourth lecture, actually, um, we're gonna go to from matter to galaxies. And uh, finally, and the goal there is to really come up with a model for the observed clustering of galaxies because that is one of the main observables with which we do cosmology in the scale structure. And then the last lecture, I'll try to go beyond this flat lambda CDM picture and that we've been focused on. So just the notation again from yesterday. Um, importantly, eta denotes conformal time defined by dt over a, um, and primes will denote derivatives with respect to conformal time. So, okay, what we did yesterday was uh, we derived how the collisionless Boltzmann equation for dark matter and baryons looks. And we argued why that's the relevant equation to look at. For dark matter, it's clear uh, at late times, uh, dark matter does not have any relevant interactions. So collisionless Boltzmann equation is appropriate. For baryons, that's not true. Baryons do interact, but we argued we can neglect that, those interactions on large scales and, and we'll get back to that. So then we combine that with the Poisson equation and um, found that this is really the fundamental equations that govern all of structure formation. We then, but then these equations, the Boltzmann equations are incredibly difficult to solve in general. So we proceeded by taking moments, um, integrating the Boltzmann equation over the momentum variable um, and obtain the continuity and Euler equation that way without pressure, right? Collisionless uh, fluid equations and the result was this set of equations here. So an equation for the density field in terms of uh, the velocity divergence and the velocity itself, and an equation for the velocity divergence, the Euler equation, or rather the uh, divergence of the Euler equation with its own coupling terms on the right-hand side. And the whole thing is supplemented by the Poisson equation. Good, so what we did yesterday is we took those equations and neglected these nonlinear terms, these quadratic terms on the right-hand side with the, approxim and the approximation that all perturbations are small. So density perturbations are small, velocity divergence is small, potential perturbations are small. And so uh, we can neglect those. And then we obtained a set of linear equations, which was very easy to solve. Um, at least conceptually easy to solve. And um, the nice result was that we found this factorization, right? So the at linear order, the density field as a function of position and conformal time just factorizes in a growth factor, which has the time dependence and uh, the spatial dependence, which is something which basically is refers to some arbitrary reference epoch, right? We can always rescale this and absorb the rescaling to the growth factor. So basically this is just the initial density field, the initial conditions from the early universe. 
And this is the equation obeyed by the growth factor, second order ordinary differential equation. And that in turn depends on the expansion rate of the universe. So we saw that depending on the properties of dark energy and the amount of dark energy that affects the growth factor. Okay. Good. So, um, so about this linear theory, right? Um, we also yesterday looked at this plot, which is the standard deviation of the filter density field on different scales. And we saw that on large scales, indeed, the density field is small, but on small scales, it becomes large. So um, this shape is really a consequence of the fact that initial, the initial conditions from inflation uh, generate scale invariant perturbations for the potentials. And because the density field is involves derivatives of the potential, it basically adds has more fluctuations on small scales. Um, and the scale invariant nature of the potential you can see here, right? Because it's basically this variance of the potential filter on different scales is actually completely independent of, of the scale. So that is another way of seeing the scale invariance. So um, good, uh, but we're of course interested in this black line here or the green line, um, which is the variance of the density field. So it's clear that if we want to describe our universe, structure in the universe on scales that are smaller than 100 megaparsec, um, then we have to go beyond linear theory. Okay, so, um, and we will see later on that this is really where almost all the information is in, in large scale structure, these smaller scales. So we want to be able to describe them correctly. Good, so what we'll do though, is we'll stick to the fluid equations because again, the Boltzmann equations are so difficult. Um, so, um, but today we'll keep these nonlinear terms. So in the, if the fluid equations have very particular quadratic source terms on the right-hand side. Uh, well, I move them to the right-hand side um, so that on the left-hand side, I have linear terms. On the right-hand side, I have nonlinear terms, quadratic in particular. So how can we go, go about solving this? In full generality now, this is a coupled set of linear or quasi-linear uh, partial differential equations. And you know that's hard enough to solve. So that is, you know, uh, the topic of computational fluid mechanics, which is a huge field by itself. It's not an easy thing to solve. But um, let's go step by step. And um, given the structure of this, and given the fact that at least on sufficiently large scales perturbations are small, let's take a perturbative approach. And so as a first step. And we'll plug in our linear solution, which we already have at linear order into these source terms, right? So we'll replace delta times theta here with delta one times theta one, both from the linear solution and correspondingly from this source term uh, and in all the others. And now these, these source terms, I mean, they are known. That's why they don't involve any free variables anymore, right? That's why I can call them source terms. Um, they drive the evolution of a second order correction to the linear solution. And so it, it turns out that this approach is justified as long as we know that this delta two is smaller, small compared to delta one, then this is okay, this approximation, right? Because basically delta two is of order delta one squared. So if delta one is a small quantity, then delta two will be an even smaller quantity. So here and here, I actually used uh, the Poisson equation um, to replace this term. The nice thing about the Poisson equation is that it's linear, so we can, you know, basically solve it correctly at um, at any given order. So now, uh, yesterday, I remember there was an excellent question on why um, at linear order uh, the density field evolves locally, right? Every point evolves independently. So you can see that at second order, this is no longer the case, right? So the, um, the density field at a given position X, which I have not labeled explicitly here because 
um, it would get too cumbersome, right? All these fields are functions of x and eta. So this depends on the velocity at position x as well as the derivative with respect to x, right? So this is actually couples different locations now. In particular, the velocity, um, right? I mean, this basically tells us how the density is transported along by the velocity, right? Good. So the basic idea then of perturbation theory is to expand all the fields, say delta matter, fractional matter density perturbation, and uh, the velocity divergence of matter, peculiar velocity divergence. So this is also a first order quantity to expand it in orders of perturbations, right? Delta one is the linear solution that we derived yesterday. Um, Delta two would be the second order solution that obeys the equation I just showed and so on and so forth. We can keep doing that iteratively and um, obtain a solution at any given order. So the idea is that Delta N consistently collects all the terms that are involved in powers of the Delta one and Theta one, okay? Uh, because that's our ordering parameter, right? So um, this approach, we think we expect it to work as long as each successive order is smaller than the previous order. If at some point that next higher order is actually greater than previous orders that we have already included, then we know that this perturbation theory has stopped converging and we cannot trust its results. So in practice, Anyway, for calculational reasons, we always stop at some order, the fixed order n. Great, so um, let's proceed with trying to solve this. Basically, um, yeah, so let's see. Um, this, in principle, we know we can solve it because uh, these are known source terms and these are linear equations on the left-hand side, so it should be possible to solve them. Though in practice, it looks still quite difficult, right? So first of all, um, you see here that we have derivatives with respect to x and we also have the velocity u. So it is convenient uh, to try to solve these equations in Fourier space. Right, so on the left-hand side, we are, again, we have linear terms. So these are all functions of X, but I can do a Fourier transform and all these dependencies of X turn into dependencies of K, right? So here, nothing big happens if I go to Fourier space. On the right-hand side though, things happen, right? So the partial, partial XJ will turn into a I KJ. And for the velocity, I can invert uh, the relation between velocity divergence and, and velocity. And then I have this I K I over K squared term, which is you know, just inverting um, the velocity divergence. So we have this uh, relation between velocity and density, which again relies on the fact that the velocity is longitudinal, right? There's no curl component here. Um, but this is nice because it's an algebraic relation, right, in Fourier space. In real space, this would be a non-local relation and very cumbersome. Okay, good. And then basically you can just go ahead and, and plug in um, the one, the chief annoying part is that here we have products of terms in real space and products turn into convolutions in Fourier space, right? You, it's fairly straightforward to convince yourself if you sit down and do the Fourier transform, you know, just try to compute the Fourier transform of this in terms of the Fourier transforms of the individual components. So the end result, yeah, um, okay. So one more key um, point, right? So here we always have uh, two linear terms, right? Products of two linear terms. And in particular, each of these terms has the same time dependence. So we can pull out an overall time dependence of, from each source term, and then it multiplies again, just some spatially dependent thing, 
So that will make solving the equations much easier because in the end, we end up with something like this. So delta two prime plus theta two prime plus theta two, sorry, is some time dependence um, that we know from linear theory times a kernel that is complicated, but is just fixed in time, right? It's just a function of k. And similarly, the equation for theta. Okay, so that, so that means we're basically, we have the same set of equations as in linear theory, just with some specific source terms, which however have a well-defined time dependence. So in fact, um, we don't even need some, any complicated, um, you know, huge computational expense to do this time integration. It's again, just a single, um, or well, two coupled sets of differential equations. Good, so uh, the source terms uh, look like this, okay? So these are basically just the, I mean, not basically, they are just the Fourier transform of these contributions. And due to the fact that of this relation between density and velocity here, um, you get these, these particular terms. And this structure of an integral, two integrals over K, over, uh, K1 and K2. By the way, we usually call the momenta in large scale structure just by analogy to, to uh, particles, particle field theory, uh, where we speak of the, the Fourier conjugate of, of, moment, of a real space position is we refer to as momenta and the same thing we do here. So you will hear me say momenta sometimes. Right, so this general structure, um, integral over k1, integral over k2, uh, times delta zero, I mean, delta linear, basically, of k1, delta linear of k2, with a direct delta enforcing that k1 plus k2 equals k, that structure is already uh, predetermined by the fact that here we have products of two uh, real space fields that ha don't have any x-dependent coefficients, right? You see no x-dependence here. Um, the x-dependence only comes in through the fields themselves. And that automatically implies that, um, um, that there's a direct delta here. And uh, just an aside, um, you might remember some things about uh, if there's no x explicit x dependence, then momentum is conserved by Noether's theorem. Uh, that applies here also. So the fact that there's no x dependence in the coefficients here is a consequence of the fact that the mass and momentum are conserved, and correspondingly, this Dirac delta is a consequence of mass and momentum being conserved. So there's a question why we go beyond linear order. Um, right, so basically all the structure in the very beginning of the yesterday lecture, I mentioned that all structure in the universe that is the result of some, all the observed structure we see, right? We observe, we detect light from galaxies. All of that is the result of extremely complicated nonlinear processes, right? Galaxies are highly nonlinear objects. So in order to, describe structure in the universe, you know, in order to connect with observation, we somehow have to deal with these nonlinearities. And exactly how we'll do that for galaxies is the topic of the next lectures, but I hope that already is enough motivation to explain why we always, we definitely have to go beyond the new order, right? We need to, at the level of comparing to observations, we always need um, to be able to describe nonlinearities. Um, good, uh, and yeah, so we have two uh, different types of source terms, one for the delta equation and one for the theta equation that have slightly different structures, but uh, um, in detail, but the overall type is basically the same. Okay, so the first thing, um, yes, so very importantly, again, K dependence and eta dependence, time dependence separate again. So we can write delta two and theta two also separably 
in a function of k times a function of time. And so the first thing to be uh, will be to solve for the function of time. Um, so here we'll actually make an additional approximation that the universe is matter dominated. Um, when we integrate the second order, um, the equation for the second order growth, that turns out to be an extremely good approximation, but what can easily go beyond it, it would just make results a little more cumbersome. So um, here I'll just, um, uh, I'll just make that assumption to keep things simple. And so what it turns out is that in that approximation, the time dependence of delta two is just the linear growth factor squared. Maybe not too surprising that it should be something similar to that, given that the source term is basically, you know, something similar to delta one squared. Um, but it's really exactly that, which is very nice. Um, right, so delta two has the time dependence of linear growth factor squared. And then the K dependence is basically a linear combination of these two kernels um, and is given, and we call that the F2 kernel. Okay, so this specific structure is just inherited from a linear combination of this structure and this structure. Um, yes, and the nice thing again is it's this kernel's time dependent. So it applies to the density field at any time, second order density field, you just plug in you just multiply it with an overall growth factor square time dependence. Yeah, so Reggie had this question, different K modes coupling in second order, and you can see precisely that's what happens here, right? So um, delta two at wave vector K arises from all modes K1 and K2, coupling all modes, density modes K1 and K2, if they add up to a total of K, right? According to momentum conservation, right? So the, explicitly we see here the mode coupling and the velocity uh, divergence actually obeys basically the same equation with slightly different time dependence and a kernel we call G2, okay? so it's. Uh, essentially the same thing. Right, and what we can see here is second order density grows faster than linear density, twice as fast if you want. And so that is in keeping with what we, what we thought about or gathered about uh, in yesterday's lecture that um, at early times structure is close to linear. And then as structure evolves, it gets more and more nonlinear because the nonlinear terms grow faster than the linear terms. Good. Okay. So, um, yes, this is uh, just a repeat of this equation. The one of the nice things uh, I wanted to mention is the diagrammatic representation, which, uh, you know, for this. For the computation we'll, we'll discuss here are totally unnecessary, but it, when you go to a higher order, um, actually they become quite useful. So um, if you look at this kind of coupling, right, the ones of you who are familiar with field theory are probably reminded of um, Feynman interaction vertices, Feynman rules. So indeed we can phrase Feynman rules as there is a coupling kernel, uh, an interaction vertex, sorry, there's an interaction vertex proportional to F2 times um, F2 as a function of the two incoming modes uh, with the momentum conserving direct delta, right? So two incoming delta one coupled to one going, outgoing delta two, where whose momentum is the sum of the two incoming momenta. So what I described just now is in very, in very much detail how we compute delta two, right? Um, this continues to higher order. So at, when you want to compute delta three, then you plug in delta one and delta two into this uh, quadratic terms on the right-hand side of the Euler equation. If you go to delta four, then you have delta two, delta two, delta one, delta three, and so on. 
So uh, you can basically iteratively construct the solution at higher and higher order. And this factorization of time and momentum dependence, K dependence, always holds. So we can define at any given order, we can define time independent kernels, perturbation theory kernels, Fn. And then the nth order density field has a time dependence that's just the linear growth factor to the nth power times momentum integrals with overall momentum conservation, Fn kernel and n fields, uh, coupling n fields, delta uh, n linear fields, delta zero, right? So delta zero recall is just linear density field with a growth factor uh, pulled out. Okay, and uh, you know, generalizing what we had here, you know, obviously I have now an nth order interaction vertex that couples n linear fields to a single delta n going out uh, with overall momentum conservation. Um, okay, there's a question of what is the coupling constant? Excellent question. So basically, um, the way I phrased it here, it's not, there's no explicit coupling constant because all these kernels are order one, but you could uh, redefine things such that the growth factors appear in the kernels instead, and then you would call the growth factor your coupling constant. And so at early times, you have a small growth factor, D is much less than one, and so you have a small coupling constant. And then as time goes on, the coupling becomes stronger and stronger. Um, that's not normally how we think about it, uh, but it's completely valid uh, picture. Um, good. So, uh, okay, so that's at the field level, right? So now we can, basically we have an idea how I co we compute uh, the nonlinear density field up to some given order and perturbations out of the linear density field, delta zero of, of K. Okay, but as I mentioned in the first lecture yesterday, and we also gathered from the other two lectures, um, in cosmology, it's always about statistics because we don't know the initial conditions, right? We only know their statistics. For example, from in, in inflation, initial conditions come from quantum fluctuations. There's no way to predict quantum fluctuations. We just know their statistical properties. So let's compute statistics and start with the power spectrum, of course, the simplest one. Um, ah, I, I should mention perhaps uh, delta M, the kernels here ensure that uh, the mean, the, ex the expectation value of delta, or in other words, the mean over into all of space is always zero, right? So the mean, and this is also a consequence of mass conservation. There's no mean density perturbation generated, only fluctuations around the mean. Good, so then um, the variance, uh, since the mean is zero, the variance or the power spectrum is the next interesting quantity. And so, okay, so the first term is just, the first term here, growth factor squared times delta zero, delta zero is just um, the linear part that we derived yesterday. And so now I'm arguing that the next two leading correction and perturbation theory uh, arises from a coupling of delta two, delta two, and then two times delta one, delta three. Okay, so why, why does it look like that? Um, there's two basic things we have to use. We have to, first of all, always make sure that we count all the terms that have the same number of delta zero um, in them, right? Because they will be equally relevant. So delta two, delta two has two plus two equals four linear fields. Delta one, delta three though also has four. So we have to keep that. And the second important point is that terms, contributions here that have odd numbers of the linear density field vanish. And they vanish because as we discussed yesterday, we were, are assuming throughout that delta zero is a Gaussian random field. And a Gaussian random field only has a two-point function, not a three-point function. 
So in principle, one can generalize, I mean, not in principle, in practice, one can uh, generalize this to include a small amount of Gaussianity, in which case the three-point function of delta zero is not zero, and then we could include it. Um, but for, for now, we will not, in these most of these lectures, we won't uh, do that. We'll say that delta zero is Gaussian, and so that term delta zero, delta zero, delta zero vanishes. So then I argued, um, okay, these, we have these two terms, which both involve four fields delta zero. So we will need a correlator of that form. And for a Gaussian field, uh, this reduces to products of power spectra in the following way. So we have first a term with two direct deltas and then P of K1, P of K3. So these are linear P of K, sorry, it should be um, to make it precisely clear. These are two products of linear, I mean, a product of two linear P of K and the same with two other permutations. Okay, and this is um, probably some of you know this as Wick's theorem, right? The way you do this is you contract each, you contract all possible pairs of these, um, all possible pairings of these four fields into two pairs of two. And once you do that, um, then, well, I actually went a bit further. So already the properties I mentioned earlier ensure that we only have to uh, these two terms and next to leading order, delta two, delta two, delta one, delta three. And now you can plug in um, the solutions for delta two and delta three and plug in this, this expansion of the four, cor four point correlator of uh, delta zero. And um, you end up with uh, this expression. Okay, so power spectrum is given by the linear one that we discussed last time and next to leading order one, which is composed of two pieces, the two, two coupling piece and the one, three coupling piece. And each of these are given by these expressions. Okay, so the two, two coupling piece involves the F2 kernel squared times a convolution of two power spectra, the P13 is proportional to linear power spectrum times an integral or a linear power spectrum with F3. And um, why, how does this work in diagrams? I think it's nicely explained in diagrams, right? So we have um, the final density field is delta one, delta one plus delta two plus delta three and so on. So um, the two, two coupling term is we take two of these interaction vertices I mentioned earlier, right? And now we have to contract the incoming linear density fields into pairs using at field theory, it will be the propagator. In our case, it's the linear power spectrum. And um, right, you contract, say, this one with this guy and this guy with this guy. And you get um, a diagram that looks like this, where this little circle now, the blue dots are the interaction vertices, right? And this little circle is the linear power spectrum. So these are the same type of Feynman rules you one does in field theory, except now uh, we have just different Feynman rules, right? So, um, but with these rules, I know immediately how this, how to write down the integral that corresponds to this diagram. And similarly for the one three term, right? I contract two lines of the two incoming lines to the third order vertex with each other. And then the external one uh, with the third one. And then I get this type of, the group integral. Good. Um, right. And so now we have these expressions. Now the P linear is uh, in general, I mean, there's no analytic expression for it. It's a complicated function that we take from Boltzmann codes. Um, so we have to put it on the computer to do these loop integrals. But if we do that, we get this result. So this shows um, the linear theory as black solid line and then as green dashed um, 
the linear plus next to leading order. The bottom panel shows the ratio. Um, so you can see at redshift one, I mean, as expected, at low k, large scales, linear theory is perfectly adequate. But as you cross k of order 0.1, the next to leading order correction becomes relevant, in particular redshift zero, right? So at redshift zero, it's already much more important than at redshift one. And so I can already read off from this diagram up to what scale I would trust my perturbation theory. So at redshift zero, the next to leading, the result including next to leading order is basically, um, you know, is twice as big as the linear result. So that means it's a significant correction. And I don't really think that my two loop will be smaller there than the one loop and so on. So we don't think that perturbation theory will converge on these scales. So we have to restrict ourselves to, to lower k. But redshift one, you can see uh, we can actually continue to quite a bit smaller scales uh, in perturbation theory. Um, uh, there was a question, do we get an exponential growth for perturbations? Yeah, so that's an excellent uh, question um, that, I mean, one thing to, I should have mentioned probably yesterday. So in cosmology, um, so if you look at an isolated gravitational system in a flat background, then uh, gravitational collapse is indeed exponential. But in cosmology, we have this expanding background and the competition between the expansion of the background and the growth and you know gravitational attraction of over densities leads to uh, roughly a power law growth, right? And that also remains in, in per the perturbative regime. Once you go to really small scales, um, then uh, you will actually recover or sufficiently small scales. I actually don't know where precisely the transition is, but once you go to sufficiently small scales, then you'll go back to the exponential uh, growth, I think. Uh, it's hard to uh, make this rigorous because uh, we'll see about the difficulties of fully nonlinear structure later, but uh, conceptually, um, I think that's correct. Okay, so, good. And there are also some questions about the K integrals and uh, infinities, if you go. Uh, yes, uh, well, I'll get to that. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so if it's about cutoff, et cetera, I'll get to that. Um, Right. Um, anything else, though? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't see anything else. No. Okay. Um, good. So uh, I mentioned that. So so so. Okay. So we just looked at the power spectrum, right? Um, I mentioned that the linear density also doesn't have any other statistic, right? So power spectrum is all there is. But the evolved density field, um, because it undergoes nonlinear evolution, actually does have um, a non-zero three-point function in particular. Um, so the evolved, the three-point function or bispectrum, we use that interchangeably, um, is not of delta m is non-zero, thanks to this nonlinear evolution, and um, the result is shown here. You can derive that in one of the exercises. It basically involves the second order coupling kernel and it's also easily represented as a diagram. And this is not in the exercises, but for everyone, anyone interested, they could try actually to at least write down the diagrams for the next to leading order three-point function. Good, and so we can actually extract information from this by measuring this in large scale structure. Okay, so now I'm getting closer to the to the loops, but um, let me add, you know make one more physical point. So um, so up to now, what we did was we put in a lot of work to do perturbation theory of the fluid equations, and we made some nice progress. But uh, the fact remains that we're doing perturbation theory of the wrong equations, right? Collisionless matter is not a fluid. 
And so at some point, the equation themselves that we're trying to solve perturbatively are going to be wrong. So what is the error we're making? Um, so recall that when we derive the fluid equations, we took moments of the Boltzmann equation and we neglected this velocity dispersion or anisotropic stress, uh, stress tensor sigma m, right? The second moment of the uh, distribution in, in momentum. And that added a force term to the Euler equation, which is proportional to the gradient of, or the, the divergence of the sigma tensor, right? But by the way, I had, um, due to conventional issues, I had a, a typo here in the lecture. So it, the density dependence should be this. Um, so I include the row actually in, inside sigma. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's see what, what does this sigma do? If we try to include it, what would it do? Um, so we don't know. So one approach would be to try to write down an equation for the sigma, but then that equation would involve the, uh, the third moment of the, of the um, momentum distribution. And we don't have that either. So we're basically back to square one. So instead, let's just take an effective approach and write down how possibly the sigma tensor could depend on the other variables we have in our system. Okay, we ha already have delta and the velocity itself. So how could the, can we write the sigma tensor? Um, right, so first of all, let's think in the perturbative framework where I have background and first order and second order and so on. Right, so at the background level, sigma m has to be proportional to Kronecker delta because there are no preferred directions. So at the background level, I have to be able to write as sigma bar times delta ij. Okay, and then at the perturbative level, I will have corrections. You know, this, the stress tensor will not be the same everywhere. It will also depend on the local density and on other properties. I can describe in detail why this density is the most important one and the leading one, but trust me, it is. Okay, at first order, we only need to include this particular dependence. So we don't know what these coefficients are, the sigma m bar and the c sigma. Let's just leave them free, okay? They can be, and they will be functions of time because the universe evolves, right? They won't be constant, but um, they will, they are spatially constant because all the spatial dependence is encoded in the density field itself. Um, no sigma, uh, okay, in my definition, sigma is not trace free in general, okay? So it includes the pressure if you want. So if I put, yeah, stress tensor, I did not write anisotropic, I think I said anisotropic stress, um, which is incorrect. It's just the full stress tensor. Yes, it has a trace component. Good. Um, so if we use that expansion, insert it into Euler equation, we get this result. Okay, so this is a linear, I expand to linear order um, and insert into the Euler equation. So the new term is basically proportional to the gradient of the density with some unknown coefficient, right? And then on the right hand side, I have unchanged second order terms. Um, so, um, so first of all, notice that this, just this background term here uh, has no dynamical effect because what enters in the Euler equation is the gradient of the anisotropic uh, agonism of the stress, right? Or pressure or stress, right? Only the gradient enters. So uh, the background, uh, we actually don't have to care about here. Uh, so then I take the divergence again, like we did before, and we see that we get a source term or an additional term to the Euler equation that's proportional to the Laplacian of delta. Okay, now you can think of what's the significance of this. The significance is that relative to the other terms like the Laplacian of psi or, or theta itself, this contribution is suppressed on large scales because the Laplacian is a K squared in Fourier space. 
So, um, so basically what we have done is we have allowed for the stress tensor to appear uh, by adding one term only to the equations. I didn't prove why it's only one, but you'll have to take my word for it, at the price of a, a, an unknown free coefficient, um, sigma m bar times c sigma. So let's, let's try to make progress with this, right? So if we just add this to the equations of motion, we can um, actually um, still make progress. We can integrate them in time as before. And basically, it's just up to redefinition of the coefficient, which we don't know anyway. Uh, the correction to the final density field looks like this. So I already argued, I mean, it's perhaps no big surprise, we have Laplace delta appearing now. Um, and so the correction to the density field is a k squared times delta. And now I can plug that into the power spectrum formula. It, again, it's much easier than these loop terms because it's a linear term. And I get a correction that scales as 2cs squared k squared times p linear. And so this cs squared is now an unknown coefficient. But if that is not outrageously big, and we'll discuss that, then this should be a small correction, right? Because of this k squared. So now let me get back to the, the issue of loops, right? So the way I wrote the loops, um, the in loop integrals was without any cutoff. So extending the integral over momentum to infinity, right? But that from a theoretical point, um, so in general, this can lead to divergences, right? Depending on the shape of the power spectrum, this could well lead to an infin infinite result, which clearly doesn't make sense. But even if it leads to a finite result, which happens to be the case for our universe for the Lambda CDM cosmology, then it's still not consistent because I'm integrating over modes that are clearly very highly nonlinear, right? So I'm, I'm pretending that modes with, with a P, where P is, you know, corresponds to microscopic scales is still linear because I'm putting in the linear power spectrum here. So that's clearly wrong. And so actually, if you want to be consistent, then this type of loops forces us to introduce something like this CS squared, capital CS squared, as a counter term. Because if you look at how this F3 kernel in this particular configuration scales, when the loop momentum is much larger than our external momentum k, then this scales as k squared over p squared. Okay, so imagine replacing this kernel with k squared over p squared. Um, I can pull out the k squared and I get something that scales as p linear times k squared, which is exactly this. So in other words, adding this cs squared as counter term absorbs um, the uh, sensitivity of my theory to um, my theoretical prediction to the very small scale modes that are not under in the regime of perturbation theory. Okay, and if you um, if you look at this carefully, you see that so k has dimension of inverse length because it's a wave number, c s so has dimension of length, and it basically corresponds to an effective sound horizon of this fluid that's not really a fluid. Um, and that will become clear in, in a second when we talk about baryonic effects. Um, but let's first, uh, let me um, extend this discussion a little bit because this was only, uh, by the way, yes, P22 also um, needs a counter term, but that one is, is much smaller. It scales as K to the fourth and, um, you know, it's, it's much less relevant, but it also has its own counter term. So, um, so this is basically um, the starting point of the effective field theory of structure formation. The idea being, uh, we know that we treat matter as a fluid, but we know that it's not really a fluid. Uh, 
and we incorporate all the beyond fluid corrections as counter terms with three coefficients um, that then need to be determined from the data or from a real calculation, namely using simulations. And so what you do is the counter terms are defined as satisfying all the symmetries, which are general covariance and mass and momentum conservation. Um, and then we will, in order to say which contributions are relevant, which aren't relevant, like I've already implicitly assumed a few times, actually, we uh, use their scaling with wave number k, right? Because we know that um, everything, um, as we go to smaller scales, nonlinear effects become important, right? So all nonlinear effects should scale high as higher powers of k relative to the le leading order. And to make this dimensionless, uh, we need some scale, right? On some scale where this, where this, um, uh, uh, where, where basically the departures become order one, and uh, we call the scale the nonlinear wave number k and l. So there are different ways to define this. Um, it's not a, a, a you know, don't think of it as a perfectly crystal clearly defined quantity. This is just a scaling parameter. And you know, if you have something that scales similarly, but has a difference of a factor of unity, that is just as valid, right? So one possible definition, which is basically inspired by this loop integral, right? So um, if I pull out k squared here, I get this integral with a one over p squared. That's exactly this guy. And that has the correct dimensions to call it k and l to the minus two. That's just one possible definition. Um, OK, and then to be more precise, how do we do this ordering? Uh, in order, because these loop integrals are in general very complicated, we make them simpler by approximating the linear power spectrum as a power law. So we're in particular interested in this regime where a structure becomes nonlinear. So, you know, in this over limited range of scales, we approximate this as a power law. Um, roughly with a scaling index of minus 1.5. And then it's actually possible to really calculate the k dependence of the loop integrals and of the CS uh, term. And you can see here that they're similar, right? So um, the loop term 3 plus n is 1.5. Uh, and this scales as k squared. So it's, um, they're expected to be roughly comparable. And similar estimates you can do for higher order loops for higher counter terms and so on and so forth. And so that's in a nutshell how the EFT works. So uh, let's see. Um, I probably won't have time for the Lagrangian stuff, but let me um, talk about the um, baryonic effects now. So you know, I, I obviously completely neglected anything that is not gravitational so far. Uh, but I've also argued that we can include baryons, right? So there's some additional error we're making. And so just to justify why that is okay, let's consider the effect of baryonic pressure, right? So that's only one of several ways that baryons depart from, from purely gravitational evolution but it's probably one of the most important effects and certainly the simplest. So let's assume then that baryons in whatever state they are at a given stage of the universe are, can be treated as a barotropic fluid with some pressure that's a function of their density, right? And now the pressure term in the Euler equation for baryons is one over the density times the gradient of the pressure, one over rho b partial i p. And now I expand the pressure around the background. So that yields dp d rho at the background density times delta rho b, right? Because again, only the gradient of the pressure is dynamically relevant, not a uniform pressure. Um, so I take the gradient and I get just cs squared times derivative of the density. 
with CS squared, the usual adiabatic sound speed um, dp over d rho. Right? So this looks exactly in the same shape as, um, as the um, counter term that we added to the matter in total, right? Uh, here, right? So here we called it C sigma times sigma bar. Doesn't matter. What's important is it's, it's whatever is proportional to the gradient of the density in the Euler equation, right? So that justifies why we use CS squared for this effective counter for this counter term, because it's basically like a sound speed. It looks exactly like a sound speed. And now if you integrate the other equation over time, you will see a correction that uh, looks exactly like uh, this term from baryonic pressure. And this coefficient will be the sound horizon of the baryon fluid. So here, you know, baryons are an actual fluid, but uh, they have pressure, and that leads to the same type of contribution. So in practice, uh, when we're just, if we're interested in total matter, we can just combine both of these effects into a single uh, CS squared. Good. Um, so I had some words on Lagrangian approach, and then going beyond fluids properly, but let me stop here and see if there's a few more questions. So in the chat, I only see the, the question of Huang Yan. Um, yes, so can we calculate CS squared? Um, yes, absolutely, uh, uh, by comparing, yes. So basically uh, what we can do is we can run a full and body simulation, and that's what I'll describe tomorrow, um, which uh, is able to solve basically the collision Boltzmann equation. And then we can compare, for example, we could just compare the matter power spectrum um, to, to the theory prediction and determine CS squared by the best match of the theory prediction uh, to the simulation power spectrum. Um, that's one approach uh, how to determine the effective CS squared. In the data, when you alternative is to actually compare to observational data and then let a CS squared be a parameter, a free parameter that you deter let the data constrain. So, so then there is another question. Um, so uh, the problem with going taking higher moments of the distribution function as an alternative to the EFT approach is that you always need to close um, the hierarchy somehow, right? So um, there is there's no physically you can't close them because we know that fundamentally it's a different equation that we need to solve. So you always have to come up with some recipe to close the what's called the Helmholtz hierarchy of higher and higher moments of the distribution function. So it basically corresponds to, you know, modeling the fluid with some prescription like that. Um, the FT approach is, is just a conservative approach, right? You, you're saying, basically, if I include um, all the relevant counter terms, and if I restrict to sufficiently low k, so that I know my higher order loops and counter terms are smaller, then I know I can describe the data, right? I know I can describe uh, the full solution to the Boltzmann equation at the price of adding free coefficients. So it's basically a conservative approach. And um, the relevance, the true relevance to me at least will come when we consider galaxies, because for galaxies, we don't have something as, similar, as simple as n-body simulations. Uh, that can provide us with a true solution. So um, there, the EFT approach really comes in, into its own. Um, well, is CS squared from observation the same with, uh, does it agree with the Boltzmann? That's very hard to say because we don't observe dark matter directly, right? So we actually only observe some tracers of the matter fluid and then the CS squared is always involved with the properties of these tracers. So in practice, um, 
so I would say uh, we have a reliable control on what the solutions to the Boltzmann equation do, different n-body codes, et cetera, but we do not really um, have a good control yet of what the data tells us, a good answer yet. Okay, so thank you, Fabian, because I think you have a meeting at 11 sharp, so. Uh, yes, I need to leave, unfortunately, but of course, I'll see you all at the Q&A session. Thank you very much. My okay. favorite. So, uh, yeah, so we have a break now and we come back in uh, half an hour.